seedless vascular plant. We talked about bryophyta, no vascular system. The next step up the evolutionary line is plants that started to have a vascular. We haven't gotten to the part where we have seeds yet, but we're moving in that direction. But first we had to get a vascular system. The vascular system will allow for the plant to become larger, and it will also allow for it to become more adapted for dry environments. So when we look at these, we're going to see what we find in the seedless vascular plants. Now, the seedless vascular plants are often called the pteridophyta. And the pteridophyta basically is an old group that dates back to the time of the dinosaurs. And as it dates back to the time of the dinosaurs or pre-dinosaurs as we see it, because these had to become the groups that fed the dinosaurs, we're going to see a lot of variation in here and a lot of very small groups that are around today. But they're somewhat unique in there. We're going to start out looking at the Lycopodiopsida. And in the Lycopodiopsida, it says we are going to have two basic groups. One is called the Lycopodiae, which are the club mosses. And the club mosses look like a moss, but it's starting to get a little bit bigger. It's starting to get more of a vascular system. The other part we see in here are the Selaginellidae, which are the spike mosses and the quill warts. And the spike mosses and the quill warts look like this. Now you're saying, wait a second, that starts to look a little bit more plant-like. It starts to get a little bit more on the evolutionary scale. But again, it is a low-growing material. It's down close to the ground. And it's starting to get into a more of a hardened form, able to exist on dry land. The other part that we can look at is what we call the polypodiopsida, poly meaning many. And what we start to get here is we start to get things that are a little bit more advanced. First part is the psilotales, which we call the whisk ferns. And the whisk ferns are rather unique, and it, it's called a whisk fern because when you look at it, you really don't see a lot of leafy structure on it. You start to see a little bit of where it's going to produce the sporangia, but the whole body of this is basically photosynthetic, and it looks like what they call a whisk, and a whisk, if you do cooking or anything, a whisk is that thing that's got all these little branches coming out that come together that we used to beat things together with. Well, that's kind of what this looks like if you stretch your imagination a little bit, and that's why we call it a whisk fern. We have the Ophioglossales, which are the grape ferns, and they look like this. And the reason they would call this a grape fern is you can see this center part coming up and then you see this spike out of the top of it and the spike out of the top of it. It's got all these little things on it that look kind of like grapes together. We have the equisidae, equine meaning horse. They call these things horsetails. And the horsetails are very interesting. We're going to see things that look like this. They're unique in that they have a lot of silica in the outside. They're not really what you're going to call very edible. You're not going to eat these things because they're going to be hard and crunchy and they're not going to have a nice format in your mouth. And they become a rather unique group as well. We have the Meritidiae, Meritoid ferns, and you find some of these things in tropical areas and they would look more like that. And that's actually a fern type, which means it is a seedless vascular plant. And then we have the polypodiae, which are the leptosporangiate ferns, and they will look like this. And again, we're starting to look more towards a more advanced type of plant material. In the polypodiae as well, we get ferns and different types of ferns. What you see here is a tree fern. This fern is a very large type of fern. This particular one was a good 15 or so feet tall. Some of these get to be rather large, but you can see in all of these cases, we're now looking at something that it becomes more established on a land area. They may need moisture, but they don't necessarily need a lot of moisture in it. So when we're going to look at the pteridophyta, we're going to see a variation of these, and we're going to go into some of these in more detail than others.